<laughs> we... <laughs> hey, everybody, and welcome to this week's episode of Freightonomics. I'm Zach Strickland, head of freight market intelligence here at Freightways with our chief economist, Anthony Smith. And we have the return of Dr. <laughs> Zach Rogers that we're going to get to here in a little bit. So I want to go ahead and just dive right into things. Yeah, we got to get straight to our market in two. Let's go straight into two. our market in two. So we get our information. We set the table. Uh, Anthony, three, let's count two, me in. one. Let's get it. All right. This is this is one of my favorite charts uh, at the moment. Is this combination of national truckload index and the outbound tender rejection index? The outbound tender rejection index that measures the percentage of tenders that are being rejected uh, from the uh, shippers uh, by the carriers. The higher this number goes, the tighter the market gets. You can see it fell off the cliff uh, earlier in the year in March. We we're up over 20%. Now we're down under 4%. Um, not a lot of movement here over the last week. However, the spot rates, National Truckload Index, did increase a little bit, and it's starting to come back down. So all this is telling me is that we had a lot of direct-to-spot market activity. We already talked about Christmas tree season. We saw a lot of Pacific Northwest activity uh, there or right around Thanksgiving. Now that's diminishing. The tender rejection index is king. Uh, it will hold the market capacity conditions more accurately, I believe, than general spot rates uh, in general will. So contract market looking good. Shippers should be having high compliance. Let's go to the next chart. Speaking of tender rejection indexes, this is our outbound tender rejection index over the last four years. 2019 is the it was considered quite a soft year, and you can see that represented in the orange line. So you can see that our tender rejection index not behaving seasonally, uh, as we would expect this time of year, with no significant increases, actually moving lower uh, through December. Uh, very strange phenomenon. So capacity very readily available. Moving on to the next one, let's look at our demand conditions in the outbound tender volume index. Total tenders being uh, submitted by shippers. Not a lot of movement here. However, we do see a little bit of strength showing up versus November here in the last week. I don't think that we're going to see this persist, but it is relatively good news to see some demand side, uh, soft, maybe a soft landing potential. Uh, but we got January to come. Probably not. Next one, IOTI, looking at the maritime sector, can lead. Shippers are not ordering booking freight across the ocean right now. Beautiful. So it is... You know, that last chart there is kind of like, it's not necessarily forward-looking all the time, but looking at the ocean freight does give you a sentiment of how shippers are viewing, right. how much inventory do they need? Yeah. Do they need to get in front of something? Normally we see like the, uh, you know, you could see it right up there now, like the Chinese New Year. In 2019, we actually saw bookings start to increase. Every single year, bookings start to increase leading into January. Not happening this year because yeah. you're thinking about 30 to 45 day lead times before those orders get to where they need to be. Um, and the shippers just aren't doing it. So inventory levels looking good. And, and so real quick, I guess, transitioning into the econ stuff because we have a VIP and MVP, I should say, uh, to, to, to join us soon. But um, one of the big things I think we're looking at, especially on the import side, of course, is upstream manufacturing activities, stuff like that, new orders, things like that. Um, the strength of the U.S. dollar has been pretty robust um, throughout much of 2022 into 2021, but we weren't the only country to really face inflationary pressures. Mm -hmm. We could potentially see some potentially see some weakening in the U.S. dollar going into 2023, and that would definitely make imports a lot more interesting. Mm -hmm. and, and if we're not, uh, we start to ramp up more imports activity mm -hmm. in the 2023 calendar year, and we have a weaker U.S. dollar, that could also start to mess with some inflationary pressures as well. Real quick, speaking on some of the macroeconomic indicators, looking at the inflationary pressures, we saw that the CPI moderated in terms of rates of growth when we look at month to month and year over year, but we're still in the fight and it's still going to look a little bit, I would say, shaky moving forward into 2023, just because we saw some easing doesn't mean that we're out of this fight just yet. Um, one of the big things that I have to kind of note here when we look at inflationary pressures is that those pressures really started to ramp up around a year ago. Just So we're going to get into some stiffer comps on a year-over-year -year basis. And just because some of it might look a little bit more appeasing on a year-over-year -year basis doesn't mean that we're out of the fight just yet. Another big one real quick that we have here from 
overall economic updates throughout this week. We also got retail sales that got updated over this last uh, November timeframe, down 0.2%. Um, downward movement in non-store retailers, downward movement and some of those shopping indices, which I see as good news. I was going to say, that's not shocking, is it? Considering no. we had a little bit of an overheated October, thanks to Prime Day and a few other things. Right. Yeah. And I think this is good news. So, I mean, we saw that uh, consumers are still spending on a credit card, unfortunately, um, from last month's updates uh, or last week's updates for the previous month. But really, when we're looking at retail sales, mm. this is not one that I want to see, you know, growing uh, exponentially. Of course, the headline number is not adjusted for inflation. Mm. But when we're looking at retail sales. I don't want to see that consumers are overseeing themselves hitting new record levels because we're seeing the savings rate now at lows that we haven't seen in over 15 years or right around 15 years. And so that low savings rate, that more dependency on credit cards is really showing that if there is a sudden shakeup in the job market, if we're seeing continued claims continue to rise, rise and rise, that's going to put a lot of folks into a really bad position. Of Could course, deepen a hole yes, <laughs> yes. for the future. <laughs> and that kind of adds into, um, of course, we heard a little bit more of a hawkish take from Jerome mm-hmm. Powell uh, in his last um, speech here. And that kind of adds to the expectation, of course, that there's going to be further rises in interest rates, which he probably needs um, to go into 2023 just because he doesn't have many tools to use that won't be inflationary. One builder. lever. I wish I had one button to push for my job. <laughs> <laughs> Up or down. Yeah. That's, 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 Up a, or down. That's a big thing right there. Uh, so that's going to be, be a nice. big one going into 2023 that we are going to expect from uh, Jerome Powell to really kind of potentially pivot there. Industrial production edged down. We did see a down movement in manufacturing after we also saw the ISM PMI also enter contraction, mm-hmm. showing that new orders are also in contraction and that there is a backlog contraction. Now, I think it was around 40 percentage point reading for the uh, ISM PMI, but mm-hmm. um, definitely some slowing indicators showing that there is a significant shift happening right now. Yeah, man. So slowing down. Yeah. <laughs> and Jerome Powell still wanting to rise, raise interest rates, although slowing. There, it looks like there's some dissent, though, yeah. going on. Like people are starting to divide their perspectives. You know, we talked about the Philly Fed last week. So I don't know. I mean, we feel it in freight yeah. <laughs> pretty significantly. Speaking of feeling freight, uh, <laughs> let's bring on uh, the man, the myth, the legend, Dr. Zach Rogers. It has been, you know, a semester now since we've had you on, sir. Uh, glad. Thanks for joining us <laughs> here in December. <laughs> Look, man, until you guys start paying the bills, I got to you know, at least pay some <laughs> So I apologize. Um, before we get anything, I got to come off the top rope about Jerome Powell as well, because here's the thing that's going on. So if you look at the, the causes of inflation, okay, if you look at the cause of inflation going into the summer, most of it was the majority for April, May, June, July, supply driven inflation. We still had shortages. If you look at where we are today and the October numbers that the Fed has put out, um, almost nothing from supply. Right. All of inflation is now a demand-driven inflation issue. What does that mean? Raising interest rates haven't really done that much, <laughs> right? <laughs> because raising interest rates should only impact the demand side. But like you said a minute ago, Anthony, people are still buying you know presents for the holidays and stuff. And so what we're actually seeing is the in, the slowing inflation rate that everybody's you know sort of celebrating and patting themselves on the back for is mainly due to supply chains really getting back on track. And working through a lot of the backlogs that we had, you know, there's there's no backlog anymore at any of the ports in California. And that much more than any sort of interest rate stuff, I believe, is really why we're finally starting to see this relief uh, in, in interest rates. So so, you know, yes, Jerome Powell has one button to push and that button has not done as much as the good people that read freight waves every day and have gotten their houses in order. Oh, man, I love it. So yeah, I, I got to stick on this one just a little bit, Zach, before we get to the LMI, because I mm-hmm. want to get to that, too. We got we got plenty yep. of time today, I think. Uh, so you guys always say that. I know. I know <laughs> we, we should. For When we have you on, we need to have an hour show. But we didn't we didn't plan very well this week. Anyway, uh, this interest rate situation with inflation. So isn't a lot of what we're seeing like the consumers basically got a adjusted to this having money thing that they had throughout the Mm -hmm. pandemic. And this demand side behavior that Anthony keeps pointing out is actually not very good uh, for the long run because they're spending themselves into further debt. Um, And we see this with companies as well. We see them still having some pretty decent balance sheets with cash flow. We're not seeing trucking market exits to the extent that we might expect 
with such a dramatic change. Is that part of why we're seeing inflation kind of stick around on the demand side is because people have, one, become accustomed to having cash, and two, uh, these behaviors are taking a while to kind of drain that cash flow? I think that is part of it. You know, we, we really did build up a nest egg, uh, you know, both on the corporate and the sort of consumer side during COVID. And, and we sort of spent that down. And now it's like, well, that was kind of fun to be spending all that money. And so I, I think that's, that's part of it. The other thing I, I think you see is, and this brings me back to what you guys are talking about with the retail numbers that came out today. And people, I think, were a little surprised that it was down slightly. Now, as Anthony very, very astutely pointed out, that doesn't take um, inflation into account. Um, and if you look at the just foot traffic numbers that we saw over the sort of Black Friday, Cyber Monday, Thanksgiving weekend, you look at how much was spent online. It was $35 billion online just that weekend. You mentioned uh, the second prime day that we had. A lot of that is driven by cuts in retail prices. You know, the, the big problem that downstream folks have been working on all year is this just bubble of inventory that came in in February and March, and we've been slowly whittling it down. And it looks like we finally have whittled it down. You know, if, if, if you break out uh, the LMI uh, numbers from November into early November, so the 1st through the 16th versus late November, 17th through the 30th, you see that inventories go from growing at a rate of, of 59.6, 60, and, and remember anything above 50 is growth, and so they're growing at a pretty moderate, uh, solid rate for the first 16 days of the month. Second half of the month, they're at a 50, okay, which means no change. And if you look upstream, inventories are actually down. And so what that says is a lot of stuff got pushed forward to retailers, and they're getting rid of it as quickly as they possibly can. Um, and so what I think some of this consumer spending we're seeing is not necessarily irresponsible behavior. I mean, a, a little bit, maybe. But, but uh, what a lot of it is, I think, is consumers reacting to the incentives around them. And the incentives around them that companies are giving them are, hey, please take this inventory off of our books. We are OK to sell this uh, you know, for 80 cents on the dollar, 75 cents on the dollar. We just have to get it out of the system. And consumers, because consumers are rational actors generally, are willing to take things at 75 cents on the dollar. You know, that second prime day that Amazon had in October – People looked at it and said, oh, wow, the, the, the level of total sales wasn't as good as it has been before. Amazon doesn't care about that. What they care about is that they had you know, tens of millions of sales happened, and they got rid of a whole bunch of inventory. And so that's what we're seeing right now is consumers are acting the way they are because they're being incentivized by firms who are incentivized by the need to get rid of all this inventory. And Dr. Zach, I think it was a great point there that you also mentioned, of course, at the top, where some of the inflationary pressures are really being driven up by um, from the beginning of the pandemic to where we saw throughout 2022 to where we are right now. Um, one of the big things I get concerned with is those inflationary pressures around the goods part. It's, it's, it's somewhat easy to deal with on a surface level. I think it gets real tricky when we start to see inflationary pressures on the services aspect. And I think that gets a little bit more tricky to kind of nip mm -hmm. in the butt there. Um, I'm interested in your take there and also some of the biggest takeaways from the LMI um, over the last uh, report that really kind of maybe shocked you or really was one of the biggest movers. Mm -hmm. Sure. So on the service side, you know, so much of that has been I, I think a, a product of two things. One, the movement back to service, which we have seen significant spending move to services. And some of that is not captured, by the way, in the retail that came out today. Like, we don't really know. Um, second, you know, I don't think any good movies have come out. So I think that's really driven that <laughs> down a little bit. Um, and then the third thing I would say is that, that you know, diesel prices are so wrapped up uh, in everything. And fuel prices, yes, they've come down. You know, they're at, at uh, you know, under uh, $5 uh, this week, 470 480 somewhere around there. Um, but, you know, a year ago, they were, at, they were at 370 And I think that, yes, those are involved in goods, but they're also involved in services. And, and I think that we see, because of the sort of runway, um, that legitimate increases in fuel prices have given goods to get in on this sort of inflationary pressure. I think all these service folks see it and say, well, if everyone is okay with 10 to 15% inflation being priced in, 
We don't want to miss out on this party. Companies are always looking for reasons, I think, to, I mean, not I think, companies are always looking for reasons to raise prices. And so I think that the very real, very, uh, you know, I think straightforward reasons that goods inflated in price sort of gave services uh, cover fire to do the same exact thing. And so I don't know how you address that necessarily um, other than eventually I think the the spending on goods and services might even out a little more than they are now. But but I, I think that's a really interesting point that you raise, Anthony. And much like what we're seeing with regular inflation, I don't really know who has the power uh, to change that too much. So uh, let's talk about the LMI. Uh, we've, yeah. we've, we haven't talked about it in detail because you haven't been here. Um, <laughs> I'm going to show my emotions a little bit. <laughs> yeah. uh, but the, uh, we do try to touch on it a little bit. So you, you get to divide it into upstream and downstream processes. Yeah. And, and really, that's, that's fascinating to me because the upstream is, you know, the leading indicator of the downstream. And that's where most of our economic indicators are focused is on that downstream consumer-driven activity. Is there anything in that kind of, like Anthony mentioned earlier, that kind of shocks you about something that you're seeing right now in that upstream behavior? Yeah, well, in fact, I'm not only going to rely on the LMI for this, I'm also going to rely on this, which I found at the North Pole, Santa's <laughs> list. And uh, let's look, transportation, you guys are getting carriers, oh, coal. That's what it is. There's coal <laughs> downstream for transportation. Now, right. what does that mean? So when we divide up, Zach, between upstream and downstream, essentially what we're splitting off is the retail side from the manufacturers, distributors, wholesalers. And we saw a contraction for transportation on both sides. Our, our overall number uh, this month was 37.4, one of the lowest numbers uh, uh, we've ever had. Uh, so that's 37.4 is pretty significant rate of contraction. And it was really driven on the downstream side. That was the right. most surprising thing to me. Because in the past, you would actually see downstream sort of being the one to pull it up right. because of consumer activity. But this month, um, transportation prices uh, upstream contracted at a rate of 42.5, which is a significant rate of contraction. Downstream, they're at 28.1, the lowest number we've ever had, uh, especially for downstream, the lowest number we've ever had. And what that tells us, I think, it, it goes back to that inventory story that we had a minute ago, which is all of this stuff was ready. Basically, usually when we're getting ready for the holiday season, everything's just in time and gets there at the last possible second. This year, everyone had everything they needed uh, for the Christmas rush, um, you know, in the summer. And so we didn't have that normal burst that we see where not only are there just in time things, but there's emergency rush orders, which allows um, you know carriers to charge uh, excess rates, and you're know, really competing over uh, potential space and and for LTLs and spot markets and all that stuff that didn't exist this year, especially downstream. And normally downstream is what we see sort of carry the day uh, in the holiday season, and they're coming in at a, at a twenty eight point one. And the reason they're coming in at 28.1 for price is because their capacity was a 75.5. Okay, 75.5, if that was a standalone number, would be the highest uh, level of transportation capacity increase that we've ever seen. And essentially, over the last two years during COVID, we built up all of this capacity, not just for the you know big trucks carrying things from the ports to distribution centers and, and wherever else, but also a lot of sort of smaller capacity, you know, the vans that Amazon has, fulfillment stuff that's that's used for last mile. And that a lot of that last mile stuff has been pretty flat. And then the real link that we've lost is, and, and again, this is goes back to the hidden parts of the supply chain, is the link between, say, retailers and distributors or retailers and wholesalers. That has been dead, that link right there, that sort of last link before you get to the consumer upstream coming to downstream has been totally flat because retailers already had everything they needed going into uh, going into the holiday. Now, I would say that that's dire on the side of transportation. For those retailers, though, it's sort of mission accomplished. You know, the thing that the real challenge, like we said earlier, was how do we land this plane? How do we get down from this crazy mountain of inventory to something that's sustainable? while also not missing out on a lot of orders. And I would think 
that the retail data that came out today, as well as some of the stuff we saw a couple of weeks ago about Cyber Monday and everything, says that not only did retailers succeed in decreasing inventories, but they did it in a way where they're not missing out on a lot of sales. You know, it's a real rock and a hard place, and they had to thread the needle right through. And I think that they did. But the sort of, uh, you know, after effects of that, the byproducts of that are there was nothing really for carriers to do. And that's why they're getting cold. (laughs) <laughs> oh, no. And so I, I'm intrigued by this point here. So, Dr. Rogers, I mean, in the LMI, we're looking at inventory levels. I have it pulled up here. Um, down 10.7 percentage points for the latest month, now at a 54.8. Still an expansion, but definitely a significant downward mm-hmm. movement. The yeah. big thing for me that kind of jumped out was that there was a downward movement in inventory costs, but really not at the same magnitude. We're still seeing that inventory costs we're still at a 73.4. So is this something that you think is going to be a little bit more sticky on inventory inventory cost side, even though we're supposed to see inventories get drawn down a little bit? Yes. Yes, I, I do. Because inventories are coming down, but they're coming down from a very, very high level. You know, I mean, e- even if you look at the inventory numbers, the business inventory numbers that came out today, October of 2022, still higher than October of, of 2021. So it's all relative change rates. The other piece of it, I would say, is is a lot of inventory costs are tied up uh, tied up uh, in warehousing costs, and warehousing costs are the opposite of what we see in transportation. Transportation costs are exciting; they, they change every day. They're like a a dog chasing a car. Transportation costs go wherever you know, just something runs by, and that's where they go. Warehousing costs are slower. Warehousing costs are more of a lagging indicator than any of the other. Uh, metrics in our in our survey because they tend to be you know long term contracts for the most part and there is some spot market stuff but even a spot market for the warehouse is not like what will the warehouse cost me today it's hey I need a, a three month lease or something like that and so because warehousing prices have been so elevated uh, for the last three years you know warehousing capacity has been down every month since August of 2020 which drives up uh, drives up price. Uh, a lot of the inventory costs are tied to that. And and really what I think we're seeing is the sort of final gasps of the COVID disruption working itself out. You know, we had the disruption, canceled a bunch of orders. Ha- oh, no, shortage. Congestion. So we order a bunch. Then we have congestion. And then we have inflation and too much inventory. And we've kind of had this back and forth bullwhip, huge oscillations. And now we're starting to get to more normal uh, rates of, of growth. You know, we, we ask our respondents every month, where is this going in 12 months? Future, where, where is everything? And we this is the first month since COVID started that we didn't have a, a number come in the 70s. You know, like, oh, prices are out of control or now prices are really low or there's no capacity or inventory is really high. Everything is pretty much in the 50s and 60s uh, other than... Uh, transportation prices came in at a 42 and that's sort of, I, I think that won't actually be a, a 42 over the next 12 months. I, I think we'll see that come up a little bit, maybe, but what it's telling us is all these numbers in the fifties and sixties is we're returning to business as normal. We're finally getting back to a place where things can start to stabilize. And, and right now, because inventories were all moved forward, it really seemed like there's, we have way too much transportation capacity and not nearly enough warehousing capacity. Probably those extremes we're at are just that, they're extremes. We're going to moderate back to the center. We're going to start using more of our transportation capacity again as we do need to reload inventories after we run them all down this holiday season. At the same time, as we run those inventories down, warehousing space will not become quite as, as dire as it has been. And so what I think our future numbers are telling us is, We're finally on the path where we're going to start to return to normal. And I would expect 2023. um, Now, you never know when uh, another virus or invasion is going to pop off. So I say this with a lot of uh, caveats. Um, But I would say 2023 is looking, at least at this point from December 2022, like it will be somewhat calmer than what we've had for the last three years. So we only have about a minute left here, but I want to get two things from you. (laughs) One is... What can shippers or companies expect uh, from the consumer over the next 12 months? And the second one is, what do carriers need to get ready for in 2023? So I think carriers should get ready to for the market 
finding whatever the new normal is. You know, we had the normal in 2021. We had the normal in 2022. 2023 will be somewhere in the middle. We'll find whatever this kind of new happy medium is. And that will come because of moderated consumer behavior. We, we finally have spent through all of our COVID stimulus. Right. At the same time, inflation is slowing down. And so we should hopefully see a return for normal to everybody. And if China really is serious about, you know, not taking their ball and going home anymore, that will, you know, really help out with the supply crunch we've had on the other side. So I think we should be hopefully uh, getting back to normal. That's that's the hope anyway. And shippers? Demand side? Yeah. So so, so demand Thinking. side would, would be tied to the consumer side, uh, essentially. I, I, I think it. shippers and carriers kind of go together because yeah. you won't have the carrier business without the shipper business. Gotcha. So return to normal. I love it. Yeah. I love it. Well, thank also, you so much. Anthony, oh. your name is in here and it says you're getting more boys large size shirts. Is that what you're getting this year? That will <sighs> 2023 will be a gun show. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Y'all have a great week. <laughs>